Can you hear me? Good. Well, hello and good evening. My name is Andy Armacost. I'm the president of the University of North Dakota. And thanks to everybody for being here uh, for tonight's lecture. Uh, this is an exciting evening. And uh, I'm thrilled that you all chose to spend your evening with us. And I should, I should say that a few weeks ago, I declared uh, this to be the year of connection, our ability to connect with one another, whether it's connecting with each other in our own communities or connecting around the globe. And so that theme is alive and well tonight as we come together to hear and discuss important topics that affect the world. And for seven years now, this lecture series called the Eye of the Hawk Lecture has invited world-renowned leaders and thought leaders and change makers to our campus to present to you. And so we're honored to be this type of hub of intellectual activity where our students, faculty members, staff members, and our community new members can all hear and connect and share in the richness of the messages that we receive. I should say that this lecture would not be possible without the generous support from our alumni and our friends who make this happen. I want to offer a special thank you to Rick and Jody Burgum, who through their generous support made tonight's lecture possible. How about a round of applause for the Burghams? And it is my absolute pleasure and my honor to introduce our speaker tonight, our featured guest, Tawakul Karman. It's wonderful to have you here. Ms. Karman is a human rights activist, a journalist, a politician, and in 2011 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of her leadership in the nonviolent struggle and her advocacy against authoritarianism, corruption, and oppression. Known as the mother of the revolution, Ms. Karman played a key role in the 2011 pro-democracy youth uprising in Yemen. She is the first Arab woman and the second Muslim woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And at the time of the award, she was the youngest recipient at age 32. Following the footsteps of her inspirations, Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi, she has become one of the pioneer leaders in the Middle East to promote the culture of nonviolence as a means to fight political oppression and to bring about institutional change. And today, Karman is a member of the Nobel Women's Initiative, an international advocacy organization created by female winners of the Nobel Peace Prize to support women's groups around the world striving for justice, peace, and equality. We had a wonderful time last night at dinner. It was wonderful to get to meet you. I'm so thrilled to invite you to our stage and to join us as the Eye of the Hawk Lecture. So please welcome Nobel Laureate, Tabakal Karman. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. I'm so, so happy to be here in the University of North da Dakota. Um, as I said yesterday, Mr. President, you know that uh, of the university that uh, I really feel myself belong to the community of North Dakota in general and to this university. You were so kind, so generous, so um, Really, I felt, I feel, you know, all the sense of love. Uh, so thank you for all this feeling that uh, you gave me from the beginning, <laughs> from I, I arrived to this uh, small and beautiful city. So thank you very much again, and um, peace be upon you again. Assalamu alaikum. And um, as I said, I am truly honored to be part of the Eye of the Hawk lecture series at the University of North Dakota, where we gather to discuss the challenges that faces humanity, and we will focus about the, on the uh, title of the uh, tyranny, democracy, and uh, global peace. Dear sisters and brothers, um, we are now 
living in the so-called era of globalization. Uh, humanity has advanced significantly in technology, particularly in the communication technology, which has reduced our world to the size of a small village, or we can say a one house, one home. The scientific acceleration is occurring at such a rapid pace that we cannot even uh, predict uh, its uh, extent. However, despite this remarkable development, humanity has done nothing, unfortunately, has done nothing to face the challenges, to the uh, address the existent, uh, exist existential uh, uh, challenges, challenges threatening uh, its shared future. The truth is that what is happening now is the opposite. Instead of addressing these challenges that uh, threatening our future, our common future, our humanity common future, it's the opposite happening, which is multiplying the problems and challenges. The benefit of globalization that commenced nearly two decades ago have been distributed unfairly, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's supposed to be distributed fairly with this great uh, gift, which is globalization, but also the benefit it is, uh, of this globalization distributed unfairly. A few benefit from this benefit and uh, monopolize the gains of globalization. And where is the downsides and hazards uh, of globaliza globalization impact the rest of the Earth uh, populace? The vast disparity or gap between rich and poor is widening terrifyingly to an extent that unparalleled in the human history. Today's poor people constitute the overwhelming majority of the globe, while the rich are few and shrinking any obligation to combat poverty around the world. This challenge creates countless, countless local and global conflict and inter, uh, and this also led to intercontinental uh, terrorism and non-stop disputes. Another challenge, which is our mother earth is suffering from the activities of humanity, of human beings. The earth and its, uh, its resources are being depleted recklessly without considering the fact that these, these limited resources belong to all generations, not to this generation or the coming generation. It's to all the generations and not even to one century or one or two centuries, to all centuries. So the fervent race to deplete the Earth's resources has led to the destruction of its biological diversity and the degradation of its ecosystem. The human activity of burning the uh, fossil fuels have resulted in increasing the global warming, in increasing the greenhouse gas emission that led to global warming and its severe you know, consequences such as droughts, wildfires, floods, tropical storms, ice melting, and other disasters you know, collectively uh, referred to as you know, climate change. These challenges now are universal acknowledged 
as an existential hazard to human and all other lives uh, form in our planet. Other challenges also that human being you know, face and humanity is facing now, which is you know, humanity has accomplished a vast array of documents, agreements, convenience aimed to upholding human rights and promoting democracy and good governance. However, these efforts have remained mainly mere ink on paper, unfortunately. The majority of people in, on earth are deprived of their fundamental uh, rights uh, and which is this right is outlined in the international agreement. Tyranny rules this time the vast area of this world. Dictatorship breeds instability and conflict. They abuse the power entrusted you know, to them by the people and often pursue their own interests at the expense of their citizens and neighboring nations. This has led to local, regional conflicts, humanitarian crises, and vicious wars, which disrupt, you know, which dis disrupt the global peace and stability. Dictatorship serves as breeding grounds for terrorism and extremism, as the dictators use terrorism as a tool to suppress their people and instill fear in others. When people also, the, the dictators also spread terrorism in an indirect way, that when people are denied the opportunity to express their grievance, their rights, their voice uh, in the peaceful means, they push them to turn to violence and you know, to be their only way to claim their rights. Or to this is not justifying of terrorism, but giving you an idea about the root and the resources of terrorism. So dictatorship also undermine the international cooperation in a world that increasingly relies on diplomacy and collaboration to address global challenges. Authoritarian regimes often resist cooperation, viewing it as the, uh, a threat to their power. So this resistance hampers efforts to combat issues like climate change, like global health, and uh, nuclear pr proliferation. Um, also, another challenges that face humanity now, which is abandoning the people who sacrifice and struggle for freedom, justice, democracy in their countries. The global, the global abandonment of the Arab Spring marked the beginning of a decline in democratic aspiration. Meanwhile, despotic regimes, sectarian militias, and extremist groups, despite their crimes, have received a recognition from the international community and unfortunately for, from many uh, countries that claim that they are a democrat countries. So while you know, at the same time, those countries encourage, support, recognize the wars against people on these countries that people you know, suffer and sacrifice for their freedom and uh, uh, justice and democracy. So they have waged war and against those people who advocated for change, for freedom, for democracy, and um, that was and still is unfair battle between those who is with the camp of dictatorial regimes and between the people who are in the camp of the democratic uh, goals 
and dreams. When these kind of Western countries are or democratic countries, when they ally with the dictatorial regimes. So this is you know, the most important uh, challenges. And one of the most important challenges now that the global peace itself is under threat. Because all of the challenges that I talk to you, the global, because this gap between rich and poor, between the unfair distribution of the globalization and this reckless race for deploy the earth resources and destroying the biological diversity and ecological system of our earth and also the returning back of the democratic country of supporting democracy and freedom. And you know, the increasing war everywhere, the increasing race of weapons everywhere, and the increasing technology that now allow even individuals to produce arms, small arms, small weapons that can reach anywhere and everywhere. So this, this, this really threatened the global race, in addition to the, the arise of dictatorism and the arise of racism. And now the pro these challenges that faces our humanity, our shared humanity, needs our collaboration, needs our work together to stop all this deterioration. Before the, it will be, there is no way to return back. We need to work together to stop this deterioration. But before that, there is a very important solution that is the humanity needs now, which is we need to the global government that oblige, that force in kind of, I can tell them, oblige, oblige the governments and individuals to commit, to, to stop any, uh, any crimes, to stop any activities that harm our planet or any activities or any uh, thing that harms human rights and democracy. And one of these measures is that belong to this government, to this gov global government, which is we need to oblige these, the rich countries and the rich individual to have certain percentage of their wealth and distribute it to the rich, to poor countries and poor people. This is, the, this is the commitment of the humanity now that we should, we should protect our human being. We should help each other. And we will not be able to do that. We will not be able to fight poverty if just a few countries and few individuals take all this benefit. And at the same time, also oblige countries to respect human rights and democracy. We need this body, this international body. This international body is supposed to be the United Nations, but unfortunately the United Nations, unfortunately, doesn't have any power to implement its rule to face these challenges. They don't have resources, they don't have authority, they play as, you know, as a body who is working, you know, on the voluntarily well of the uh, 
uh, members countries. So this is one of the most important solution that humanity needs now. An international body that well protected the human being, the humanity, the existence of humanity, especially on you know, protecting our Mother Earth from the deterioration that is you know, attacking everywhere and it's now we see it on the climate change. And at the same time, we need people like you, special students and faculty members, to also to do your commitment as we said that the government should do their commitments, should be fulfill their responsibilities on respecting their citizens' rights, on respecting democracy, on stopping corruption, on implementing rule of law, we, at the same time, there is a rule of you, from you, students and faculty and people like you, that you should be aware about these challenges and should participate in facing it in individual way, in your society, in your university, and in everywhere. And especially to be the voice of people who suffer from dictators and authoritarian regimes. And to be outspoken very loud, outspoken in front of your governments, your policies, bad policies that double the integrity and health of our planet and also the integrity and health and freedom and democracy of the people inside your country and outside your country. So it's your matter. I came from a country, a very beautiful country called Yemen. I'm proud that I came from this very important, very strong country in history, in resources, in people, and we have a great, a great history in democracy, and the great environment, a great resources in oil, in gold, in many, and the most important resources that we have, which is the people themselves. How strong they're, they are and how active they are. So these people suffered from the dictator for about 33 years. This dictator destroyed the country. This dictator uh, steal all its wealth. And our country is a republic. He wants to make it as a monarchy. And to uh, what is Waritha? To inherit is it? To, to inherit, inherit its power to his family. And this is the same thing that happened with the, most of the Arab Spring countries. For 33 decades, we faced all kinds of corruption, of lack of uh, uh, good governance, of abusing power, of violence of waging war, of using terrorism, of using wars inside our country in many kinds of wars to divide the country just to rule. Who stand up in front of, stood up in front of this dictator? Students and the faculty. People like you said enough is enough. They said, enough is enough. And they went to the street without any kind of weapons, with just with their flowers, just their voices, just their songs, calling for peace, for freedom, for democracy. And they died in front of all the violence of this dictator. For just freedom, justice, democracy. And the same thing happened with all Arab Spring countries. And 
these people in all Arab countries still struggle for their freedom, democracy, justice, and rule of law. And they win. We win in our first battle, in our first step in front of this dictator, dictators. We pushed, we forced these dictators to resign through our great Nobel Peaceful Revolution. It's about 10 revolution, we forced about eight dictators to leave the authority in our Arab region. Eight dictators who felt us down, who betrayed Arab Spring. It is not just the counter revolutions that is led by Saudi Arabia, by Emirates, and by Iran, those three countries who tabled and wanted to, to table, not table, they, they couldn't succeed, wanted to table the, the, the dream of people for democracy and freedom because they afraid from Arab Spring, they afraid from democracy. Not only them, no, but your governments. Not just Russia and China, the authoritarian regimes, they, that they have a very big coalition with the dictators and their regions. No, not only them, but the democratic governments, such as United States, such as Britain, such as Canada, and other countries who, uh, who claim that they are democrat while they destroy democracies in our countries. They claim that they are democrat while they afraid from the will of people. They think that the in their interest is guaranteed by the dictators, and that is really shame. Shame on them. So this is one of the most important challenges that faces humanity, and don't think that is, it, is not something, it is not something that you shouldn't care. No, the only local affairs in the U.S. is sh something sh we should care. No. No, the, all the deterioration and all the violence and all the discrimination, all the racism that is happening now in the Western countries, one of the most important result of it, it's abandoning the people who sacrifice and struggle for their freedom and, de and, 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 and democracy. All the hatred that is now increasing in the world, one of the reasons is what is happening in our countries. So if you want to save your country interest, first thing, protect the values of the United States. I love United States. I love America, and I love how this country built the values, regardless of, on what happened when in the beginning of establishment of, of the United States, when they came to here, but the values of equality, freedom, democracy that shaped the new United States, that shaped the constitution of the United States, that shaped the lo laws, I love it. And we love people, we love the American people, they are so kind. And there's a very big question that uh, why they hate us. No, we don't hate any people. And some of us in our Arab uh, uh, country, they say, why do they hate us? No, there is no hate. The only thing is bad policy of the politicals, of the regimes, that they think that with you know, collaboration with the bad governments, uh, is the only way to preserve the interests. No. When I said that United States now should wake up and protect its values, that doesn't mean that there is a problem against United States. No. It's a problem against the policy of United States that support dictators, that double our democracy and our freedom. The same thing when we said 
talk about Russia and China. And it's shame, as, as I said, for the United States as, as, as a country who protects democracy, who said it's a free, it's the, it's the leader of free world, and to do like, you know, these kind of, of acts. So we need to work together. Really, we need to work together. First, to protect your democracy here to protect your values here. I live now here, I live in Boston, and I feel myself as the one and a citizen of this great country. And I want this country to really, really play its role, to protect its values, and also at the same time to protect the freedom and human rights around the world. This is its duty. Otherwise, it will be a weak country. Otherwise, who will take this place is authoritarian regimes like Russia and China. So the battle now, it is not inside United States, inside Britain, inside Canada, inside France. No, it's more than that. It's the battle for between the camps of democracy and the camps, the camps of dictatorship. And the camps of democracy should prevail. Otherwise, everything will collapse. And we will inherit the chaos to coming generations. So the solution is, for is that these democratic countries should wake up now to protect their values now and to protect humanity for all, from all that deterioration. Finally, maybe you think that I am pessimistic that uh, with all this chaos, with all this uh, deterioration, but the opposite, it's the opposite totally. I am full, you know, with dream and optimistic. And I think that I am the most op optimistic woman or human being in the world. Um, I am optimistic for many, many things because the first thing I believe in people. I really believe in people. And that is from the, yeah, from the first step of my journey for defending on human rights. Believing in people. I started my journey alone in a very conservative country that doesn't say, yeah, allow women to play a public life and be in, in, uh, in public life um, uh, alone as a result of the policy of dictators, not as a result of our great history. Because we, have, we are a country that's ruled by a, a very great queens. And one of the most queens that ruled Yemen was the queen of Sheba Bilqis and Queen Arwa. So this is the bad image to women in Yemen, it wasn't as a result of our history or our heritage. No, it is a policy from the dictator and himself. So under the rule of the dictator, I was alone. Women calling people to wake up alone. And people was laughing at me, didn't believe me. The government did all the kinds of of yani, tools to stop me, starting with defaming me, bullying me, arresting me, trying to kill me, etc., etc. But all of that didn't stop me. And I have a lot of threat, a lot of advices to stop. And they told me, Tawakkul, you will die alone in the street. No one in Yemen will listen to you. I told them, I believe in people. I believe on our Gilead people that they will one day wake up and follow the dreams of freedom and democracy. And that's exactly what happened. Millions of Yemeni people were in the street chanting the same chant, singing the same thing, dreaming the same dream that I carry for them and I call them to do. So this belief of people is still there now. 
I believe that people in Arab Spring countries will prevail their great battle against dictatorship. And I believe in American people that they will prevail in their great noble battle against extremism, against racism, against any kind of collaboration between their governments, regardless of their, if they are Republican or Democrat, all of them should be committed to the American values. And no one will force this government except you, the students, the faculty, the educated people. This is your responsibility and duty. It is not something you, it's your responsibility and duty. Otherwise, everything will collapse. Those dictators are, uh, ally are, are, are coming together and together and together. And in addition to destroy our, our democracy in our countries, I'm afraid if they will be able to interfere and destroy the current democracies, the strong democracies. And we, it, it needs a lot of explanation in this regard. So I believe in people. I believe in myself, I believe in dreams, and I encourage all of you to dream. I encourage all of you to dream as big as you can. I encourage all of you to act as a leader, as the one who is responsible for saving his family, his community, his city, his country, and the world. If anyone consider himself that I am responsible and I am capable to do that, we will be able to create change. So let's be all of us the leader of a change. And let's be all of us to make a good future for next generation and all the coming generations. So let's be that person that that people that the coming generation will be proud of. So be strong, be fearless, always embrace human rights, always fight injustice, corruption, terrorism, racism, always work for peace, equality, human rights, coexistence, and love. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Let me just offer my thanks again for joining us. I see microphones coming up. I, I believe, are we open to questions? Yes. Yes. Great. So um, if you have a question for Tawakal, please uh, raise your hand and the microphone will come your way. Hello. Uh, my question is fairly forward. What guidance can you offer the next generation of activists and individuals who aspire to affect meaningful change in their local communities, particularly in the realms of democracy and safeguarding of human rights? Uh, the most important advice, as I said, is first and, and the last. You should believe in yourself that you can make it. If you believe in yourself, you will be able to convince others to be with you. And also, always believe that you have the capability. You are so blessed that you are belong to this century, the 21st century, that giving you all these tools, especially with the communication tools. So you are strong enough to do very big change especially people who belong to this country, the free world, the democratic world, you can do a lot of things. So if you believe in your 
pose in yourself, if you first dream what you want and don't stop dreaming and make your dream bold and there is no fear from consequences, believe me, people will follow you. People will believe in you. And always, always, always search for the truth. That is very important. Search for the truth because what we suffer as a people who still sacrificing, still su struggling for freedom and human rights and democracy, we are suffering a lot from misinformation. Not just misinformation that is spread, you know, during the, uh, the uh, uh, social media, which is a very big challenge, very big challenge that we face because of the authoritarian regime used <laughs> this misinformation to threaten and to kill and to stop the pages of uh, human rights defender, et cetera, et cetera. But also it is because misunderstanding and ignorance. If you protect yourself with knowledge, if you look for the truth, if you be skeptical of the resources, if you go and listen to the people who really sacrifice and work for human rights, you will be a good activist. If you just follow the misinformation, like what we suffer from, that, that Arab Spring did, and people failed, and the alternative of the, uh, of the current authoritarian regime is terrorism, and this is what media shaved the results of that is, I can't, I can't explain that, but no, it's, it's unfair. So if you want to be a really advocate for human rights, tell the truth and be the voice of people because people in America, in Africa now, in Africa now are really sacrificing and struggling uh, for freedom and democracy. The same thing in Arab countries, the same thing in Latin America. So be with the people, be the voice of people and don't listen to anyone who want to, to, to defame the struggle of people. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Devendra Pant. I'm from Nepal and I work in the medical school. And it's a great pleasure to hear I have two questions, very quick ones. How do you look at the current uh, war in Ukraine? Is it a, a battle war between democracy and autocracy? Or is, is it a battle of uh, between uh, civilizations? And as you know, uh, since you live in Boston, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, Harvard professor uh, Huntington, uh, who wrote the book uh, Clash of Civilizations. So that's my first question. The second one is about France, since you referred to France. Uh, the recent uh, uh, event in France, I mean, uh, the French uh, Ministry of Education, they did not allow a uh, Muslim girl wearing niqab uh, in the classroom. And, uh, and there was a debate uh, a few years ago, you know, uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, case, and also uh, interesting debate between uh, uh, bikini and uh, burkini, and that happened in probably in one of the, uh, you know, like in French. Oh. Uh, so and why I'm referring to France. France is a country of Voltaire and Rousseau and, you know, uh, Jean Paul Sartre. So do you feel that the French society have failed to incorporate, let's say, multiculturalism? Uh, and America is still struggling, but we see a lot of movements here and uh, even me as a faculty, I mean, we teach our students how to be more inclusive. I think that's one of the beauties of American democracy. Okay, so just thank you. Highlight those two issues. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I fully support Ukrainian people. And I visited Ukraine last year. And uh, I met with the people there. And I listened to their stories. And it's really, really heartbroken, you know, the war itself, it's ugly, but it also made me very sad because the same scenario that happened in my 
country in Syria, for example, is happening in Ukraine. So why we make this scenario to return and repeat again, again, again? When Putin decided to in kills to kill the uh, Syrian people in Syria, that moment he decided to invade Ukraine. When he was away from accountability of the international community, from his acts in Syria, in uh, Kerem, in Syria, he has that he felt that he is immune. Then he dared to, to buy Ukraine and to wage wa war in Ukraine. So we really, really support Ukrainian people. And we, fi we find it's the same battle, the same battle of freedom, democracy, and equality, and independency, independency. So we salute them, and we are with them. And uh, the world should stop Putin fr yani from years ago, not uh, um, and, and, uh, now. And it is not just it is not just the matter of stopping Putin in Ukraine by supporting Ukrainian people with weapons and stop uh, you know his invasion and force him you know to fail in this battle. It's more than that. It's more than that. Is stopping every dictator. Every dictator he supported, and he will support. Every dictator should be stopped. Otherwise, there will be many Putin, and Putin will be you know, more strong, stronger and stronger and stronger. This is very important. And, and listen, when I say that stopping dictator, that doesn't mean that I encourage United States or Europe or Western you know, for, uh, for uh, uh, external interfere for uh, invading our countries, for sending us weapons. So no, 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 it's very, some very simple things. Just stop supporting them, only. Just st stop supporting them. Freeze their assets if, they're, if they kill their people. Don't give them legitimacy. Not recognize the military coups. Don't recognize the militia. Don't support them. Only thing is just don't support them. We are, <laughs> we are capable enough to stop these dictators. And only your support give them the kiss, the life kiss. صحيح التعبير والترجمة ولا ها perfect. I said is it great translation? Literally, he said perfect. <laughs> really. They were dying under the voices of people for freedom and, ju and justice and the support of Western countries. And look, 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 again, I always criticize Russia, China as authoritarian regime. But I criticize the democratic country more than them because they are the one who's supposed to support democracy, not to, not to, to betray democracy. So the only one who gave those Counter-revolution and those authoritarian regimes, the, the life case or the case life is the Western countries. Now, do you know that we face an ugly kind of counter-revolutions in our countries? It takes many, many, many phases. One of the most important phases, which is terrorism. And this is, today we were discussing with some of the faculty members about that. So as I said before, so they told the world, OK, look, what is the alternative if the Arab Spring win, which is ISIS, and which is Al-Qaeda, and this is the alternative. While these terrorists, the their first victims is the revolutionary people. Their first movement is to, the, to occupy the liberated land from the, that it's liberated from the authority uh, 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 of Syria. They killed the civilians from Sunni, from Shia. So the only their, these terrorists is their, their enemies is the people who struggle for freedom and democracy. 
and they occupy their lands and they defend you know, the, uh, our face you know, of Arab Spring. And the second phase of the counter revolution, which is military coup, like what happened in Egypt. They made a, very, uh, a military coup in 2003 against the elected uh, president after the, the, after the revolution. And Western government, governments recognize and give legitimacy to this uh, military coup. And the militia coup in Yemen, Houthi militia supported by Iran, and the war waged by Saudi and Emirates, and they supported Saudi and Emirates by weapons. Look how they participate in toppling the global peace, the global peace. So it's very important, again, to know your duty. It's very important to work together, and I really count on you. I really count on you that you can do a lot in this regard. Uh, the, second, the, se the second question, which is about France. Uh, and before France, I want, uh, before talking about hijab and niqab, uh, what is happening now in, in Africa, the military coup, I am against every military coup in the world. I am against any democracy that may be welcome through military coup. So I condemn this military coup that happened in Africa in many cases, in many countries in Africa. But at the same time, I am against and condemn the colonial policy of France in Africa that led to this coup, stealing the wealth of people, supporting the corrupted uh, regime, and also the tyrannies there. So I am with the will of people, and France still play a bad colonial role in Africa. And people uh, has a very big, 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 you know, duty and responsibility and burden to free their countries now from the affiliation of France, and the same time from the affiliation of Russia that supported this, you know, military coup. But again, the will of people at the end will prevail. The third thing about hijab, niqab, it's, the, it's as, we, as we supporting the freedom of people to wear what they want, to don't wear anything. So we have to support the people, right, to wear what they want. So uh, for me, I don't like niqab. For me as Tawakul, I don't like it. I don't prefer it. I like people to interconnect. I encourage Muslim women to don't wear it. But it's her right if she wants to, to write it, to wear it. It's her right. Why do you interfere in her, in her, you know, in, in her uh, affair? You have to make another, you know, commitment that you are, you know, you don't do your work, you know, especially Macron himself. So he is one of the models that also spreading the hatred, you know, uh, uh, and division inside his countries, and that is very wrong. But I really, I really encourage every woman, Muslims woman, to don't wear the niqab, but don't blame her if she want. But I really don't want, I like, hijab or without hijab, I don't, my, 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 my daughter doesn't wear it, but my sisters wear them. So it's the choice of people. It's kind of the choice of people. Why do you interfere? So if she didn't act violence, if she didn't act or he didn't act, uh, now people are wearing the mask. And this is a kind of new girl, mask. So will these people who cover their images, you know, or faces by a mask will commit crimes? So it's silly, you know. The we have two more questions. We'll start okay. over here. Hi, my name is Ryland. I'm a student here. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I have a two very short questions. Um, now that you're uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and a lot of people look up to you. Who would you say you look up most to? And secondly, uh, what's your favorite food from back home in Yemen? Oh my God! <laughs> uh, uh, 
<laughs> you made me hungry. <laughs> I hope that there is a uh, Yemeni restaurant here to invite all of you to have this uh, meal. But if you come to Boston, or if you come to Istanbul, or Doha, or inshallah to Yemen, just email me and I will invite you to my house <laughs> and give me or you a very good dish of Asid and or Fahsa or Shafut. Oh my God, it's a very delicious. It's spicy and very hot. And we eat it with the stones. Uh, and you will like it. And you will love Yemen. Really, you will love it. Anyone who visits Yemen, they fell in love with it. It's, oh my God, I miss it a lot. So uh, you're welcome to Yemen from now. Um, and the person that I look after and to be like, really, there is a lot of great people around the world. And uh, I really take an inspiration from every great man and woman. Um, and there is heroes that uh, I really, really look after to be like them. And one of these heroes is my father. God bless him. He died years ago. Uh, he is the one who, who nurtured me to say no to any kind of injustice. He is the one who tell me from early age of my childhood to be responsible, to always consider myself as the key of solution, to don't wait solution from any other. So always, always, he said, my daughter always be in the front line, always say I am, I am the one. And in most of my lectures, I say, Please look for this poem in Arabic, find the, its translation, and my dad uh, yani make me save it. Uh, save it. Yeah. Uh, taught me this poem, which is إذا القوم قالوا منفتا خلت أنني عنيت فلم أكسل ولم أتبلدي. If the people look for someone who should do this thing, who I ask, who is the one who will solve this problem? I say, I am. I am the one. And I will not be lazy, and I will not be late, and I will not be silly. So always, Tawakkul say, I am. Why do you ask? Why don't they do that? Do it by yourself. And this is why I consider myself is the one who will save Yemen and free the Yemen from dictators since I was a child. So my father and other you know, heroes like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, I learned a lot from Martin Luther King and his civil rights movement, really. Uh, Nelson Mandela, and I learned a lot from our queen, Sheba Bilqis. I, um, I think that she's my real true inspiration of a strong woman who led a great country, a led a great nation, a great civilization, Sheba Kingdom. It's more than Yemen. It's, it's more than to Africa, to half of the Middle East. So I'm so proud to be the son, the daughter of Queen of Sheba, Bilqis. Thank you for coming and sharing. And thank you to your father for bringing us you. Uh. Um, <laughs> I don't have such fun questions. Um, I think in the US, we tend to not believe that we'll ever lose our democracy. We, we talk about it sometimes, but I don't think we really ever believe that could happen here. And you talked about Yemen having a democracy and having a long democ democratic tradition. And I know other places have had that and lost it. So um, talk, can you talk a little bit about how that happens or how you saw that happening? Look, before that, really, really, I beg you, يقولوا, I beg you, American people, to protect your democracy. It's very important. Don't let any person to hijack your democracy. Either you are Republican or Democrat. Democracy is belong to every American citizen. 
to every citizen in this planet. Don't allow anyone to hijack your gains of this great, great victory of American people. America without democracy is nothing. And all the world without the democracy in America is nothing. I was, you know, terrified when some events happened here that maybe will collapse American democracy and that, that will, you know, cause a very, very big chaos around the world. So don't think it's America, it's something related to your American. No, it's American is, America is a great country that should keep its greatness and it will not keep its greatness without reserving and defending on its values, which is democracy, equality, freedom, and rule of law. And protect your values, everyone. Don't think, so all the democracy around the world are under danger, not just in our countries. That is still, you know, we are fine and we're trying to reach democracy. Your countries is really under the threat. So you educated people, students, faculty, any people, if you don't aware about that, that, is, that, that means that you betray your country and the coming generations. So protect your own values, protect your own country, and always, always think and know that the greatness of America came from its values not from any other, it, it is not came from its arms or its violence, or no, it came from its values and it's uh, presenting itself as the leader of the free world. So about democracy in our countries, it was under the rule of authoritarian regime, it was, there was two kind of authoritarian regimes in Arab Peninsula, there is absolute authoritarian regime that doesn't believe in democracy, like what is happening in uh, uh, some kings in, king in kingdoms like Saudi and Emirates, and they don't believe in democracy, yeah. and also Iran, th there is a fake democracy. So there is kind of authoritarian regime, and there is kind of authoritarian that doesn't practice any kind of democracy, and authoritarian regime that use democracy as in a fake way. So just you, like Yemen before, it's considered as uh, an emerging democracy, an emerging democracy, while the dictator, <laughs> there is no way, there is no any link between him and democracy. Fake election, fake parties, fake particip women participation in everything. So when we made our revolution against him, we made it to reach to the rule, to real democracy. And when we rule our countries after pushing him to uh, uh, resign, we rule our countries about two to three years. And there was a kind of a true democracy that we ruled the country. There was some, some mistakes, but we guaranteed the democracy that we wanted in the draft of constitution that we wrote. We made a great national dialogue, gathered all Yemeni people, all Yemeni people, all Yemeni components, all Yemeni parties in one table for 10 months, and we decided the destiny of Yemen. And we wrote a great constitution that guarantee the freedom, that guarantee accountability, that guarantee good governance, that guarantee women's rights, kids' rights, all the details that we were asking the dictator to give us, we wrote it in the draft of constitution. But unfortunately, after that, the, the militia coup happened, the war happened, but people is still, is still, uh, is still, you know, uh, struggling and continue their, their way and their battle for freedom. I know that that was the last question, but I will ask me the final question myself because it was 
it was one of the best question in the in the in the in the in the lunch. One of the doctors asked me, Tawakkul, how do you yani, have all this optimism with all this chaos that is happening, you know? I said, as I said before, because I believe in myself, I believe in people, and I know the future, and I know the history. The history told us that uh, every great revolution followed by counter-revolution. Every great movement followed by counter movement. But people who determined to continue their will, they be the victorious at the end. And this is what American Revolution taught us. This is what France Revolution, even the deterioration that is happening now, but also taught us every great revolution. And this is what is what we suffer from. But also my optimistic came because we didn't lose all things until now. The, the opposite is happening, which is we win many battles. This is, you should know that people in Arab countries win. It is not simple to overthrow a dictators who ruled your country for decades of oppression, of corruption, of abuse of power. It is not easy. 10 years we forced the dictator of Yemen to leave, the dictator of Egypt to leave, the dictator of Libya to leave, the dictator of Tunis to leave, the dictator of Sudan to leave, the dictator of Algeria. 10 years, only 10, it's actually nine years. And then you said that we fell. And then you said that, we, why do you? No, it is not just the hope came from nothing. While I can create hope from nothing. I can create it, and I should create it. But we actually win the first step of our great movement for change and for freedom and democracy. We actually, and I am so proud, and I will continue to be so proud that I am one of these great people who make this, who uh, light this way for people. I'm so proud, so proud of myself. So proud of people who were around me. So proud of women who led this, this street in all our Arab Spring countries. I'm so proud and I, will, I didn't regret and I will not regret and I know that one day our destiny, our destiny and the world destiny will be with the world free from dictatorship, from racism, from hatred, from corruption and from everything bad, because humanity, human being like you, will be the future of this world. Thank you so much. Talakol, you, you are the light that lights the world, and I know that your optimism and your commitment to those principles and the values that you talked about certainly inspire all of us. We're delighted that you were here for us with us for a couple days, and uh, we, we know that our, our friendship will be long and enduring. Yes. So you're a friend of the University of North Dakota of and yeah. of the state of North Dakota. Thank you so much. How about another round of applause?